Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Um, it is a pleasure and honor to be here, um, to be here again uh, for many different reasons. I've I never visited this school ever um, prior to two years ago, really, um, but I've been here so often um, and really um, congratulate the school and, and many of you in this room uh, who have really taken leadership in pursuing justice um, for your institution, for the patients that you serve, and for yourselves. Uh, and talking about and naming racism. Uh, it is critical work that is, I think, all very clear to us. Um, to this day, it's been critical work for a very long time, but we just haven't been really talking about it or doing much about it um, on the institutional level especially. But really, um, you all are, are in the lead um, in doing this and, and transforming your institution. And I just wanna know that I get inspiration from many of you in this room in order to continue this work. As somebody you know, mentioned earlier, this is hard work. Um, and, but it's not only important work, it's the right work, it's the best work, um, and it's work that um, is not something that sits in the surface, but definitely connects to many of us deep into our souls, um, and who we are and how we show up. Uh, and so when I go through this, I have a lot of slides, uh, but I will try to go through as fast as I can. Um, I added some, I've done this at several med schools already before in the city, which is also a really exciting um, opportunity and also a demonstration of the movement that you as a school have started um, in the city and across the country, that other folks are asking people to come and talk about racism um, in their institutions. And so um, let me move forward. Uh, I think it's very clear to us you know, that the urgency is here uh, for why we are talking about racism uh, and, and structural forms of oppression and how they impact the work that we do and ultimately how they impact the health um, of Americans and of New Yorkers. And there are many examples. Um, I mean, when I did, I did this actually in October. I didn't have this slide. It was, it was, it's interesting how fast this conversation has evolved in, in a short amount of time uh, and it will continue to evolve. Um, we're very clear and most people have heard this particular um, quote from Martin Luther King. Uh, and I think it's ever more important uh, today. And so it's no question uh, at this point in time, I tell people I'm not in the space of trying to prove uh, or you know, explain do health ex disparities exist, do inequities exist, is racism the cause? I, there's plenty of evidence, plenty, plenty, plenty of evidence that supports that, where we need probably more evidence um, around or really understanding the, the impact and the role of institutions um, the impact of policies and the structures of racism, and then the intersections that occur as it relates to race and gender and class. But we're all pretty clear on the public health side, not all public health people, but us in the New York City Department of Health, that racism is a fundamental cause of why health inequities exist. And so in New York City, we are a city of neighborhoods. Um, this is our map of our 59 community districts. Uh, and our role is to make sure that we are protecting the health of all New Yorkers. But we are clear that uh, when we look across these same neighborhoods that not all New Yorkers have the same opportunities um, in the pursuit of optimal health. We can see the differences. This is infant mortality and premature mortality. Um, and you're gonna start to notice the patterns. Uh, this is, many of you have probably seen maps of New York, but if not, these are the, and they're very helpful. Uh, they're helpful in elevating what injustice actually looks like. But it's also helpful in explaining um, a root cause of, of health inequity. And so if we look at um, the next slide, this is the, looking at the health outcomes and we look at the neighborhoods, uh, what do we see, right? The same neighborhoods are, are in bright orange or dark red, whichever it is. Um, and the social conditions, same neighborhoods affected by the same social conditions. So we can make a choice of either to do something about it, right? We can name it, we can name this difference. Um, we can say the differences exist. The question is, you know, what are we going to do about it? And then how are we going to understand why does it happen so that we can really create solutions around what are we gonna do about it and solutions that are actually gonna work. And so for the most part, what we've hear, heard in the public health space now is an understanding of, and you'll hear the phrase of social determinants of health, I often say it's becoming a little bit of jargon at this point in time because people use it so often. Um, and it's not really explaining the full picture of 
inequities and, and why they exist. And so we understand people, um, this is one particular model that where you live, work, play, and pray impacts um, your, your health. Most people have heard that, right? That's, that's like common language now. It wasn't 10 years ago, which is really interesting. However, it's an incomplete picture. That particular model is also incomplete because it doesn't really speak to what else is happening in the neighborhood and why are these neighborhoods consistently um, red and bright orange. And these maps really highlight that there is really no biological reason why there are differences in health. And that, for the most part, if they're showing up on a map, that means there's some structural root to that reason. Uh, and clearly, this is about racism, and we believe racism to be one of the leading, if not the leading, um, cause of why these inequities exist. And when we look at the history of um, how neighborhoods have been created, and we look uh, across the country, and especially the big cities, we really point to a time when policy um, in the early 1900s two policies, um, one um, by the, well, both by the Federal Housing Authority or Association um, that said that blacks, they did redlining, many of you have heard that, where blacks and, and immigrants um, could not purchase housing or they weren't going to get supported by banks to purchase housing. And so they were not able to move out into other neighborhoods and they weren't able to move out into the suburbs and they really had to stay within cities and the confines of certain areas within cities as well. And then the other piece of policy that happened uh, was the pumping in of dollars to build public housing. And public housing has really led to um, the hyper concentration of poverty as well as super segregated cities. And we have not been able to overcome those two policies really to this day. They still have tremendous impact on almost every single thing um, that we're able to do and, and where we're able to live, um, where everybody's able to live even in this room. And it's important that we acknowledge that and, and those structures have created and, and placed people um, for us to say where you live, work, play, and pray impacts your health. It's because of the roots of those policies that are rooted in oppression. And so racism is a powerful system. Um, I'm going to go, I'm not going to talk in depth about uh, you know, different levels of racism. I'll, I'll mention them very briefly. I feel many of you have had training from my understanding already in that, so this is an advanced audience. Um, but I also think it's important that you pursue this information um, on your own. And so there are four levels of racism and people have different ways of talking about this, but internal, internalized, um, interpersonal, institutional, and structural. Most conversations in the country rest at the interpersonal level uh, and that's where, because it's the one that's most visible. Right, it's the one that's heard, it's the one people see, it's the one where people get concerned whether they're gonna be called a racist or somebody is called a racist. And that's where we tend to live. But our goal is how do we look at the institutional and the structural impacts of racism and then also the internalized because oftentimes we, those are really private conversations with ourselves that we don't tend to have with others about how we feel towards other people based on the things that we may have heard when we were growing up. Another piece of the conversation that usually is also very much left out and why things are racialized is the larger system of um, power privilege and really the root of white supremacy in which most folks have been, um, who have come to this country at some point in time, the immigrants, the early uh, European immigrants, whether you're Italian, um, Irish, were racialized. Uh, and then over time, our definition of race has evolved and it's really the big demonstration that race is definitely a social construct and, and nothing more than that in, this, in a small way of saying it, but it's a social construct. Peggy McIntosh, um, I elevate her because she's one of the leading uh, folks who speak about um, white privilege uh, in this country. I had the opportunity to meet her, not intentionally at all, I didn't even know that she led this work for all her years. I was at a Kellogg conference, W.K. Kellogg, who have, they have racial healing um, conferences every two years or so. And they were doing StoryCorps. And they had, in StoryCorps, people tell their stories and then they're put, I think, in the National Library of Congress to be stored forever. And um, it was my birthday on that day and I said, you know what, let me do this StoryCorps thing, see what it's like. I go into the room and, and this is the woman who was sitting um, at the chair across from me, and you do, it, it's two people. You're interviewing one person, or one person is interviewing the other. And the first thing she said to me before I even sat down was, I want you to interview me. 
And I was like, what? You know, we're at a racial healing conference. How is this white woman telling me what she's going to have me do to her or for her? Um, and so, you know, I'm already triggered, you know, as it is. And so we get into the room um, and we start talking. And as she starts talking, I start to realize that the reason why it was so important for her to be interviewed was one, because of her age, and two, because she wanted to make sure um, that her legacy was not forgotten and that the work that she was so passionate about to do her entire, that she did her entire life, that she was able to have that passed on and that history was documented. And so it allowed me, and this is why story Telling is so important and sharing with one another is so important because it really creates that space of vulnerability where you can listen and hear people and hopefully understand that most people, you know, want to be successful, they want to, you know, love and they want to be connected to people in this world. And oftentimes we're just not able to get and break through those barriers because of how somebody shows up or how somebody looks to us. And so it was a very powerful moment in my life that I will never forget. And she learned a lot from me as well. And it so happened one of the programs that she was doing was actually um, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. She does um, programs with elementary schools to educate elementary school children on white privilege. Uh, and I grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And it was a very painful kind of growing up experience for me. So she felt also healed to be sitting across from somebody from that place um, and all, in a place where she did so much work. Um, most of us are very clear at this point in time that we have unconscious bias and implicit biases. And a lot of the language kind of sits right there. I think what's great about um, the work that you're leading is that you're pushing it beyond just talking about implicit bias and unconscious bias, but the structural issues of how we create policies and practices that influence what we do. This is done by, um, and many, some people have already seen this before, um, an artist in Baltimore. And I put this up mainly just to demonstrate that if we look at the American experience and, and slavery and segregation, it's actually more of our experience as an American, as a country, than not. And so we're still really in this very new period of American history um, in which we didn't have, um, I mean, we do have policies that still um, exacerbate and, and promote um, racism, but we're, we're still in a very new um, history in which we talk about freedoms and experience freedoms in a particular way. And so you can imagine that because of that, then racism has been institutionalized on many, many different um, levels in this country throughout history. I'm not going to go too in depth, um, and these slides can be shared, but we have the enslavement of folks, and, and I'm focusing right now my conversation on um, African Americans and blacks, um, it is Black History Month, but also um, that's just where my lens is right at this moment. But understanding that there are many um, folks who experience oppression under the lens of racism that may not be necessarily of African descent as well. So we went through a period also of Reconstruction where, you know, this was post-slavery um, and, you know, feeling that maybe that we're going to have some progression um, in, in who we are as a country, but that quickly um, due to fear uh, and concern about actually jobs and labor and, and having this increased workforce um, that we had this new period of then Jim Crow um, in which uh, racial segregation was actually codified into law and then civil rights and then we have present day and this is a little bit incomplete because I would say we're in a movement of some sorts now uh, but the movement has is really just uh, spanned the entire time. This is just really the ongoing liberation that we're experiencing right now um, of people of, especially African descent, but people of all across this world um, who have experienced the effects of colonialism. So we've never left the movement, per se. Uh, there is much historical context. Many of you have, are familiar probably with the med medical apartheid by Harriet Washington, um, and she's here in New York City. So if you haven't um, picked up her book, I suggest you pick up her book. Um, it's pretty... Uh, powerful, um, and she's also always open to be a speaker. And then Alondra Nelson, also here in New York City, who you may be familiar with, wrote Body and Soul to really talk about um, the experience of the Black Panthers. And so when we talk about public health now, we have to make sure, and for me as a public health professional, that we're not just highlighting disease and injury, we're not highlighting just mortality, 
Um, we're highlighting the living conditions that are there in the middle, but we're also speaking to institutional power um, and institutions such as the one that you guys are, are working and, and going to school in, and then all the social um, inequities that exist that contribute to that. And so this is one framework. There are lots of frameworks, lots and lots of frameworks, um, and I'm just presenting a few of them very quickly, but I don't feel we need more frameworks either. It's just, we don't need any more. We like, get it. So here we are. So this is another one that's just looking at neighborhood health, and I talked about neighborhoods earlier, but the impact that, you know, it's racial, residential segregation by race, as well as um, income, uh, resource distribution contribute to what happens within the neighborhood, and all leads to stress and, um, and impacts health. And then this is um, by Nancy Krieger, who's at, um, at uh, Harvard. And she's actually her and commissioner are very good friends, uh, Mary Bassett. And this is, this is a very complicated way, in a sense, of looking at this. But what I do like about it, a couple things. One, it's talking about, in the middle, the population distribution of health. So it's not just about one single person, but a population level impact. Um, it's speaking to the intersections of race, class, and gender. And then also that there's a political economy or political influence or determinants to why or, and how all of these um, present themselves. And then lastly, it, it, it um, affects across the entire life course. It's not at one point in time. And so that's why I think this, this particular um, piece is useful. And so when we look at racism, we're clear racism causes um, different levels of stress. And there are different levels of stress. We have positive um, stress, and maybe I have some stress now where my heart's beating, and you know I talk a lot, but still talking, you know, can be stressful. And then when I get in the car on the way going back, I'll I'll calm back down, and that's fine. We all experience that. Then there's tolerable stress that happens, um, you know, a death of somebody that we're close to, um, and that that stress can be a little bit feel a little bit more uh, traumatic per se. And then the toxic stress that really never shuts off. Um, and a lot of folks and a lot of our na uh, neighbors and residents that we serve um, are experiencing toxic stress, and that's extremely traumatic uh, through one's experience. And so trauma is very complex, but it's also very common. Uh, we don't often talk about the impact you know, of racial trauma and racial racism-related stress, um, but it can happen at all levels um, of racism, and it's important for us, as you guys are doing it, to make sure we name it uh, and that we speak directly to it. And then the other piece that often doesn't get talked about is institutional betrayal. This is really a concept that folks um, that Smith and Freed really were talking about uh, women who were in colleges and they were um, raped and how institutions weren't responsive to that. Uh, and so kind of we could apply it to something similar to what happens to by our healthcare institutions towards the patients that we serve. Um, and it can affect us as employees, so employees who may um, experience something different on the outside of the institution, they come into the institution, um, and the institution is not paying attention to it. So an example that I think of was, um, especially during the summer when we had two shootings that were back to back, uh, and or my staff, all staff in our health department, um, definitely had a reaction to it. People were walking around kind of numb. Uh, and if we didn't acknowledge that as an institution, that can feel like as an institution we're betraying you know, your experience and what you're going through. Uh, and so it's important that we acknowledge uh, those things. And then it can happen externally. And oftentimes, and this is, we're hearing more of this, more evidence is coming out. How many people, um, this is not the title, actual title of the article, but saw this piece. I don't have it. I highly recommend everybody really finding this piece. Um, it was published in the International Journal of Health Sciences. It just came out last week. Um, and it was part and funded, we partly funded it by the health department, done at uh, CUNY. But it's looking at um, the, the practices of, um, and the system of um, academic medical centers. Um, and how they are highly segregated. Neil Kalman, Dr. Neil Kalman, who many of you are familiar with, speaks to this very often. Um, but this is another article that just really elevates it and elevates actually a, a distinction between here and Boston in that actually our hospitals, uh, our academic medical centers are more segregated here um, in New York City than they are in Boston. And I was saying earlier in the car, because we're such a progressive city, um, and we're a competitive city, and we're a city because we, we were multicultural. We tend to not 
um, allow ourselves to be criticized. Uh, but I think what's I, I, helpful about pieces like this is that it's allowing us to really look at what we're doing. South Bronx, a similar experience. Um, when Legionnaires broke out about uh, two years ago, uh, many folks in the neighborhood would say, you know, health department, you haven't been here before. Um, you know, we feel you've ignored us over time. Why are you here? You know, and it played out in the news, and that's just a, a history of fe feeling betrayed. And then one of the best ways also to hear how folks are feeling is asking. And so we did lots of focus grouping this past year with um, leaders in, who are doing maternal, infant, child, paternal health uh, to speak with them, you know, how, how are you feeling about our institution? And these are some of the quotes that um, elevated during that time. And I can share those as well. And so what do we do? Um, one, in supporting our patients and our clients or participants, whatever it is, uh, it's important that even during times of this, what's happening, that we don't walk into an exam room, and I get time is limited, but we need to find some ways, um, whether it's in the waiting room that people are able to be supported or within the, the visit itself, to even just ask, you know, how are you coping with everything that's happening? And there are a lot of assumptions that are being made in the sense of, people are having issues because not everybody may, is, is potentially having an issue with how things are happening. But I think it's still important nonetheless in any kind of visit that you have with somebody, how are you doing and, and, and what's happening for you. Um, it's important that we try to you know, really listen clearly, we all know that, but also resisting the urge to be defensive. Um, when it starts to talk about race and racism, there's a lot of anxiety that picks up. Perception Institute talks a lot about racial anxiety and stereotype threat. Uh, and that we need to recognize that these topics, um, even talking about them, are stressful. But this, we launched this year, NYC Well. Um, it's a 24-7 talk, chat, text um, that's available for your patients and for us as well. Um, Self-care is a, a very, very important thing. It's important for us as um, providers who are providing care for our patients. Um, it's important for us as activists who are doing this work. And it's very easy, and especially now, and, I, and to be very transparent, I have been struggling with figuring out this balance of um, when do I go on the streets and when do I stay home? Um, I have work to do. Uh, and it's, it's been a little, uh, I try not to say the word overwhelming, uh, but it's definitely been more stressful for me in trying to figure out how do I negotiate all of this without feeling like I'm not doing enough uh, or understanding what my role is clearly. Uh, and I think it's important that the more we talk about it with one another and those issues are find that safe space, um, we can do that. As an institution, when something happens very traumatic, it's very important to create a space that people can talk. Um, again, after the shootings um, that happened last year, Commissioner was very good in making sure that we had our folks from our mental hygiene department uh, during lunch hour and during another two-hour session, have an opportunity for staff to come and just talk. Um, it was a facilitated process, but they just talked about what they were experiencing. And I think that's very important because one, you're acknowledging um, people's pain in a sense and their experience, and two, you're allowing people to move on and to feel that it's okay to be in that space. I recommend in this time, and you guys are learning it already, is learning the language of racial equity, power, privilege, unconscious bias, all of that, and there are many tools to do that. I just have two that are here, the Race to Power of Illusion. We actually have it streamed on our SharePoint so that the entire agency um, can, walk, can watch it at any particular time. Uh, cracking the Codes, I also felt was really well, was really well done, and because um, it's more about storytelling, uh, and I feel that's uh, sometimes a better way to enter. And then Project Implicit, which is at Harvard. So this was an email. Um, this is just a demonstration of what Commissioner Bassett sent out. Um, to our staff, just acknowledging um, post uh, some of these shootings um, that we are here, acknowledging racism exists. She sends these emails out pretty often. Post-election, she sent them out, just acknowledging that I get it. This is not about necessary solutions, but just I'm here with you, um, and I understand, and I'm a New Yorker, and I'm an American. Acknowledging, so one of the first steps to becoming um, a racist, a racial justice, multicultural institution is really um, acknowledging it. Because 
what I mentioned already before are really the short-term efforts, right? That's the immediate and what happens in the immediate. But we have to think, think through what do we need to do in the long term um, in order to help support us transforming our institutions so that we're always prepared and we're able to respond. And so Georgetown, um, folks may remember this in September, uh, made a formal announcement to apologize for its role in slavery. Um, and they provided, I think, post that um, tuition for some of the descendants. This is not reparations, but it is um, an acknowledgement that we have, uh, have a role in it. And so one of our call to actions when Commissioner Bassett came on board was to really highlight that inequities um, in health are unfair, unnecessary, avoidable. New York City is one of the most unequal cities in the United States and one of the most segregated. This email, was, this was sent out to the entire agency. It was very clear that this was the direction that we were going to be moving in. Many remember um, her article, Black Lives Matter, um, a challenge to the medical and public health communities. Um, it was, it's a landmark piece for New England Journal of Medicine to have published. And she also has um, a TED talk on um, social justice and racism. And one of her largest demonstrations and her commitment to doing this work was starting the Center for Health Equity, of which I'm the founding director. Um, and our role is really to elevate all the work around health disparities and what's happening, but it's also to talk about everything that I talked about in the first half of this presentation. Um, and not to apologize for having that conversation uh, and, and, and to move it forward and to think about what do we have to do as an institution. And these are our values here. This whole piece here, I kind of I joke around sometimes um, that one, you know, it took a, a whole staff. I have 180 staff now, and so we all did this together. Um, and so it was, you know, we had a consultant, and so the consultant was like $20,000, so <laughs> to do this one slide was like $20,000. <laughs> um, but it was a very important process. Uh, and the other thing, I, I acknowledge that, and you, you know, you all are in a very valued position as well. It is not a common opportunity to talk about racism in your workplace, and especially not in government. And so, you know, I'm able to, before Commissioner Bassett came on board, people, we weren't even really able to say um, health inequities. We couldn't write that in our publication. I remember this back and forth um, discussion. Uh, that we had to use disparities, we couldn't use equity, and you surely weren't going to say racism. Uh, and to now, you know, be in an institution where I, you know, I walk down the halls and I can say racism, racism all day long, you know, it's, it's a pretty powerful thing. Um, folks, I think many people have probably seen this, but one of the pushes of, you know, we really are talking about equity and not just equality. And understanding, even in our pursuit of equity, that there are a lot of realities about how things are showing up, that the achievement in pursuit of equity is, is not easy, um, because that's just not, it's not how people are and how our nation is set up. So these are our five approaches at the Center for Health Equity. Um, one is to help support the agency become a racial, just, and multicultural organization, um, to make injustices visible via data and storytelling, invest in key neighborhoods, place-based efforts, we're launching neighborhood health action centers. There's one on 115 and Lexington um, that will launch very soon. And advance a health equity in all policies approach where we help city agencies um, understand their health impacts of their work. So whether it's housing or city planning, um, uh, education, um, we worked with small businesses, what are the health impacts of the work that you do? Uh, so that we can pay attention to that more. And then how do we amplify community power via collective action and volunteerism? Also very unique for um, a health department. How do we merge, um, again, re really, um, public health and community organizing approaches? Understanding organizing is important for change. And so the way that we're doing our internal reform, and so this is to me is a way of how we um, handle institutional racism is or start to address it and confront it is we're working with the Center for Social Inclusion um, and we are working to normalize, so normalize conversations, um, making sure the space is there, staff are comfortable. This is where all the train, this is the training bucket. Um, and a lot of folks are sitting in the training space probably in this institution. Um, the next piece is then how do you organize within your institution so that the information doesn't just sit with people, it moves beyond training, it becomes part of your structure. Um, for dissemination, for communication, and for sustainability. 
because leadership can change, and as soon as leadership can change, all of this can go out the door. So some of this, the integration, I was talking to somebody earlier, that your, your curriculum now is it's part of your curriculum. It's not an extra course or a, a special elective or anything. This is part of your curriculum from my understanding, which is awesome. And then operationalize. What are the tools, what are the metrics that people are going to use to actually look at their work to see how it needs to change in terms of practices and policies? Uh, and then we have four action areas that are over here that we're working towards uh, for communication, workforce, um, equity, community engagement, and budget and contracts. Those are our areas. And we have lots of folks across the agency mobilized and organized to lead this work. We're, we have 6,500 employees. Uh, and so in 13 divisions, so it's really large uh, and it's overwhelming at times um, to really figure out how do we reach everyone and we haven't yet, but we're working towards it. Um, these are our various lenses that we are working um, towards. We have a gender justice in initiative that we just released and launched and we'll be following the same framework and aligning with what I explained in the previous slide. Um, one of the first efforts that um, when Commissioner Bassett came on board is when she came into the agency, back into the agency, recognized that while our workforce was very similar, the health department workforce was very similar to other city agencies, as well as when you looked across you know, New York City, very similar um, distribution of race and ethnicity. But then when you looked at the leadership, there were tremendous gaps. And, um, and it was from this that she really started that conversation with our institution so that it became very practical for um, the, her cabinet and executive staff, the other deputy commissioners, that this is how racism shows up, one way of how it shows up. Um, and that we have a responsibility as leaders within our institution to work towards changing that. And you know, she was very intentional and she's very proud of um, the diversity of her cabinet. When I was there before she came back on board, there were no African Americans, no Latinos, period, in the, um, in the cabinet level staff. And in the assistant commissioner staff, which we have about 40 or so assistant commissioners across the agency, I was one of the only African Americans on the policy and practice side, and there were no Latinos. Um, and so there's been a huge transformation um, and the diversity of the agency, which we know impacts um, the work and our thinking and how we, how we create solutions. Uh, other things to consider um, that you know, an institution can do, especially here in New York City, um, is you know, there's a Thrive NYC, which was launched last year. Uh, it was our roadmap for mental health. It's, we're one of the big cities really doing this across the country um, in a very um, comprehensive way to really work towards how do we change the culture, but how do we also strengthen our services? So this is an opportunity for everyone in this room. So the commissioner, we are required, um, every person in the health department is going to get um, our one day training on mental health first aid, but it's really open to absolutely anybody. Any New Yorker can get this training to help them better recognize and respond to um, mental illness or, and really mental health. Um, and not so much that they're treating, but they're able to link, they're able to have the conversation um, with other people where the conversation is usually very uncomfortable and very stigmatized. Um, so this is something that's here that we as a health department, we have to train across the city a quarter of a million people um, over the next couple of years or so. So if anybody's interested, please let us know. If the institution is, let us know as well. Uh, I'm not going to speak too much on this, but many have heard of trauma-informed care. San Francisco has an awesome um, model. We haven't moved as much into this space um, as a health department, but I think there's a tremendous opportunity but San Francisco um, has really done it across. I think they've trained their entire health department as well as their healthcare systems that are connected to their health department as well. Um, structural competency also, I believe, um, and I think some folks have had training. I know Kamini has mentioned structural competency training before. When I started into this work um, as founder of the Office of Minority Health in Suffolk County almost 10 years ago, we were just talking about cultural competency, and I was, that was the first time I was introducing that topic. Medical students had never heard of, at that time, um, this, and this is 10 years ago, it's not that long ago, never talked about health disparities, never talked about cultural competency. All this was very new to the, the conversation. And we've clearly, we've evolved a lot from saying cultural competency. It's not sufficient enough um, on many different levels. Uh, and really, you know, then people are talking about cultural humility, but we're really moving more into structural competencies 
um, and how do we understand the systems and the policies um, that we're incorporated in that impact the work that we do. Um, and so when we think about the structural level of the work um, and here in New York City, one, I, I like to give honor especially to medical students here at Mount Sinai, um, as well as others across the city and the country um, last year for really spurring activism. Uh, again, people have heard me say that you know, I grew up post-civil rights movement. I was really raised, you go to school, you get good grades. I was raised very individualistic, um, as many people in my generation are. We were not really taught the skills, and those skills weren't passed down, and, and what it means to be collective, and the importance of being collective, um, and coming together, uh, and, and being activists. So the generation now, and many of you, because you are young, um, are experiencing something that I didn't experience at that particular age. And so you now embedded into kind of your education and, and points of where you're very vulnerable. This is going to be a part of who you are, like, and, and that this is what you do to create change. You protest if you have to. Um, you speak up against your institution, uh, where many in my generation were very afraid and still afraid to do so at this point in time, um, which I'm sure you've encountered uh, in many ways. So I think this work is, is very important in terms of having a collective focus. The other piece that um, was also part of the 60s generation, and a little bit before that as well, is understanding that as health professionals, our role isn't only to deliver services and to see patients, but if we really are interested in the health of our patients, we have to figure out what are the other uh, mechanisms of what influence health and how can we help inform and support that. Uh, and I elevate um, Dr. Jack Geiger, who um, some of you may know, not, may know and may not know. He's still alive uh, and he's still here in New York City, but really, really called for, and I recently met him for the first time, but that community health centers um, and even hospital institutions really should be instruments for social change. Uh, and that as we see issues come forward, you know, as we, we notice people aren't able to get their medicines or they're not able to drive somewhere, um, that we have a responsibility to collect that information and, and take that to another level. I, the great example, I think, our modern day is Flint, Michigan, and the doctors now understanding a lot of community residents were already advocating and saying something wasn't right before doctors even came forward. But, you know, it was really the advocacy of a pediatrician um, who was noticing, you know, these lead levels were high over and over again. It didn't just let it go and just didn't continue seeing patients, but said something's not right and took that information elsewhere, and, and we know what has happened since then. Those are the opportunities that we have to figure out how do we incorporate that into our systems, um, and how do we pull that information and that data from all the data that we collect from our patients every single day. Um, collective action is very important, and um, Kamini Dubai, who everybody knows in this room, um, who I value um, very, very much uh, for her leadership, always impressed by it, uh, and last year um, came together with her and other folks to really um, you know, start the New York City Coalition to Dismantle Racism, and she's taken it to many levels, and it's growing and growing and growing. So just this is an important, important thing. No other city, from my understanding, is really is doing this, not with healthcare professionals, all in medical institutions and academic institutions and public health and health unions coming together to do this work. This, we're in a very unique space, um, and I think it's very important that we have to work towards making sure that it's sustainable. And sustainability happens when we all become a part of these opportunities. This is, uh, so, so this is also me. Again, I'm, I work for government. This was during the middle of a government day, right, a work day. That's the commissioner, if anybody doesn't know, that's the commissioner, um, Dr. Mary Bassett. Many of you may know uh, Dr. Bill Jordan, um, myself, and all of you know uh, Kamini. Uh, but we um, had our protest in front of um, Community Health Care Network. Uh, but as government officials, we usually don't get to do that. It's really, it's actually attention. Um, we don't, we aren't activists in that sense, and we don't protest. But Commissioner Bassett says, yeah, we're going to go out there, so we went out there. Uh, and so, um, you know, I'm, I don't know what, to, I just, I love that picture. And uh, <laughs> it's, I, 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 you know, I didn't go to med school thinking that I was going to be an activist, right? Um, and most of us don't. 
or in that sense. Um, it's very much connected to how I grew up and my experience, and, and my passion comes from my experience growing up. I never thought I would be out there um, helping to fight for justice in this way, and it's such an honor to be able to serve New Yorkers in the capacity that I do as a, as a New York City government folk person, but even as a physician as well. The other thing that I think is extremely important as we start to mobilize and organize more is finding um, alignment with other movements that are also um, fighting for social justice. And a lot of times they're fighting for health as well. Um, and it's, this is just one of the movement for black lives. Um, you know, this is clearly stated in their policy agenda of what they have interest in. And so I think it's important that we find those opportunities and those connections. As health people, uh, you, you're very, 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 very credible messengers. Um, and the more we use our voice, not only as a collective, but um, even as individuals and writing pieces um, and op-eds, you, you will be surprised at how many people will be so excited um, and, and news outlets and journalists to have you write um, something. And I think at this time, it's ever more important that physicians um, really take their role. You know, physicians have received a lot of criticism in how the healthcare system evolved over the last 20 to 30 years and that we were pretty silent as um, a community. And what's refreshing to see is that I don't feel physicians are silent, at least not here in New York City is not my experience. I don't know where other places as much. Well, we know they're actually activated in other places from all the different um, protesting that's happening. But it's so important that we step forward um, and we really claim not only for, uh, and advocate for protecting the Affordable Care Act, but there are many public health policies um, that impact the lives of your patients as it relates to SNAP and the Farm Bill, um, nutrition, all of these um, bills, teen pregnancy prevention, all of these have impact that are outside the Affordable Care Act as well. And so we have to really um, diversify in what we call out in regards to health and try not to just be, uh, just try not to talk about the health care system, but all of these other systems that we know impact our health. So this is an, a joint article with myself and Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis, who is now actually acting deputy commissioner um, at, of disease control in the health department. And we have a blog. So this is, I'm at the end. Uh, it's Black History Month, as I mentioned before. Most people know that. And so who, anybody know who this is? Or anybody have heard of him first? And, and so most people haven't. But what's interesting is that, one, clearly he's a physician. Two, he's a physician that was born here in New York City. Um, and three, he is the first African-American physician to practice medicine here in this country. And so in 1937, he received his medical degree over in Scotland because he could not get a degree, he could not go to school here. Um, he was a freed slave when he was born uh, because he was born here in New York City and after 1799, if you were um, born, uh, even if your parents were slaves, you were, you were free. Um, he had the opportunity to go to what they called an African free school here in Manhattan um, and then went off to school uh, and came back. And when he came back, he was actually um, the first medical director of the Colored Orphan Asylum. And so he was the first medical director. And this was a very important thing. They have about 400 children who um, would come to this particular um, asylum. About every year they would house about 400 children. And he lived in what they called Manhattan, the Fourth Ward, Ward, which is around the Lower East Side. When President Lincoln became president, um, there was a lot of um, talk and warning by the Democrats at that time, because remember, the parties um, flipped in kind of their values and philosophies um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And so Democrats were warning um, white folks, uh, white middle class folks, that, and especially Irish and Italians, that blacks were about to be free potentially under the leadership of President Lincoln. And so in um, January of 1863, anybody know what happened then? The Emancipation Proclamation, one of the best executive orders we've ever had, <laughs> talking about an executive order. 1863 was the Emancipation Proclamation, a presidential uh, executive order uh, in order to, that um, ordered the, the freeing of slaves. And then it was um, institutionalized in the Constitution later. A couple months after, um, in March um, of that same year, um, 
another thing happened that really um, spurred riots within New York City, here in New York City. And I elevate this because a lot of people think New York City just, you know, was always this wonderful, loving city. Um, we didn't have the same issues as the South, and to some degree that's possibly true, but we have, we had and still have our, our issues. And so also the draft was instituted around that particular time because the Civil War was still going on. And it required um, anybody who was eligible, um, they had to sign up um, in this draft and potentially could go to war. Now wealthy people at that time could buy themselves out of having to go. Um, and blacks were exempt because they were slaves and they weren't considered citizens. So this meant um, that a white working middle class, they were the ones who were really having to go to war and it infuriated um, white middle class folks. And so riots broke out pretty heavily um, for about five days uh, in New York City uh, and were to the point where they ended up um, not only, and they had limited power in attacking uh, wealthy folk, but there were lots of deaths and there were lynchings of black folks in New York City. Um, and, they, and this particular picture was on some, uh, was by a waterfront in Lower East Side um, of a man who was lynched, a black man for this. And so um, Dr. Smith, who lived in that particular area and who had served in this particular institution for so long, actually ended up moving from there to Williamsburg, Brooklyn. But the big part of what was really um, saddening is that the orphanage that was located on 44 and 5th Avenue was burned down um, by the rioters intentionally. And so fortunately, there weren't many children in there, they said, and there, you know, there, there weren't that many injuries. But it dissolved, the school no longer existed. Um, it did uh, move, apparently was rebuilt up around 140th or, and up there, but never really was for colored um, children post that. Um, but I think it's in a very important, on many levels, one, to recognize that these issues um, of what, the, in the impact of colonialism and supremacy um, are certainly not new of what we're experiencing today. Um, and that it has been bad. Uh, and it feels bad now, and it, it is bad from my point of view. Um, but we have been through these times, and I, I believe it's our advocacy, our collectiveness, um, our spirit of wanting to belong and to love um, is what is going to have to keep pushing us through to continue this fight um, for justice uh, for all people uh, in our country, um, as well as for us as a profession and our patients. And so I say um, to the right um, over here of oh, James Baldwin's quote, uh, since we live in an age in which science is not only criminal but suicidal, I've been making noise as much as I can. Uh, and if folks haven't seen his, um, the documentary by Roa Peck, Roel Peck, uh, I highly recommend I Am Not Your Negro. Usually I have the video, but I, I guess I didn't remember to put it. But it is fantastic. It's all the voice in the language of James Baldwin, um, who somewhat of a, of a prophet per se, um, but I highly recommend people see it. So I Am Not Your Negro. But this is, thank you. Thank you for speaking with us. I just was hoping you could comment on the difference between talking about and teaching about unconscious or conscious bias and talking and teaching about racism. Racism is, is more a system um, of which we operate in and it's, it's more powerful and it influences many different aspects of who we are. Unconscious bias is just, is more so, it's, it's a process, right? And it's something that we have that prevents us from understanding and seeing that system of racism. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of a lens in a way of how we look at everything else, the unconscious bias piece, or not see everything else. And so it's just a piece and a process to understanding um, the larger structure of racism that occurs on many levels um, that can be visible and that's invisible. Um, my question has to do with, um, is the, the position of commissioner of health, is that an appointed position by the mayor? Mm -hmm. So I feel vulnerable in this space of knowing what happens when administrations transition and the policies and process and appointed officials um, who come in with the changing administration mm -hmm. can oftentimes make, be influential in disrupting some of the progress that we've made. What are some of the things that you think that we can do 
as New Yorkers, as citizens of the United States of America, um, to protect our systems and structures against the vulnerability of transition in leadership? Sure. Uh, and it's a, it's a great question, and it's what we think about internally in the agency as well, because we're very clear we're in an election year. Um, and so that's why we're really pushing to make sure it's built into the structure and the infrastructure is there to hold it on, hold on to it, um, but also changing language in certain policies around employees' tasks and standards um, so that it's also solidified. We're in a political environment, so what, I mean, what do we see happen, you know, when you guys are fighting for Affordable Care Act? and people are protesting, what, what's, ha who, what are, what's the action that's mostly happening outside of protesting? What are people doing? Petitions. Petitions, meetings, with whom? Senators, right? So, and, and people who create policy and, and can influence in this, in this city. And so at the city level, we can go to senators, and I think that's important, and, and, but there's a lot that the voice here collectively Folks, they don't hear from doctors, ever. Like it's, the doctors they hear from are us from the health department, but for the most part, there is no collective of doctors that are going to city council, and not just as a one-off thing, but just like a regular thing, and building those relationships with your local city council people um, to speak to the issues that you know that are happening, but also pushing and asking for certain agendas. I, you know, the beauty of, where I sit, per se, is that I, I see the spectrum of so many things, of institution and also of community av advocates and activists. And politicians are so responsive, and they should be, right, to those who are living in our neighborhoods if they are active and kind of right in the face of the, the politician and pushing their policy forward. And so we are all activists. We're all New Yorkers, in a sense. We all have uh, citizens, and so I feel we should utilize that opportunity more so than we have for sustainability purposes. And so you can think about, you know, what are the things that would create sustainability? What are the policies that would help influence um, the hospital systems as well as the public health systems in New York that are rooted um, in a lens of, of racial justice? Uh, and bring that, and they'll listen right here in New York City. And, and physicians? I think are such credible messengers and very powerful. We don't even realize how powerful our voices are. You guys recognize it to some level, right? When people hear you're a doctor, you know, or a health professional, people are like, oh, you know. <laughs> it's true, whether it's earned, you know, or, you know, it's whatever. But people are responsive to it, and I would say, and use it. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.